All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a back-end engineer at Zapier. Uh, we're hiring. More on that later. Uh, but I wanted today to share with you something that I've been working on in my spare time. Um, but I thought we might mix it up a little bit. Uh, so we're going to go on an adventure together. We're going to explore a dungeon while we also explore some Python code. So I hope you brought your imagination. Uh, to help you out in places where I will be acting as your dungeon master, uh, as well as your, your Python guide, I will be wearing this enchanting <laughs> hat. All right, so the hat is now on. Uh, it begins as these things are wont to do at a tavern. <laughs> While relaxing at the sleeping parrot with your trusty companion Pip, you're approached by a bespectacled man with salt and pepper hair and a Short beard. You've never seen anyone who looks like him before. He introduces himself as a player of a game of fantasy adventure called Dungeons and Dragons. But he needs your help to alleviate some of its tedium. For years, you see, I've taken a pencil and paper approach to preparing and running D&D sessions, he says. That means I need to read an encounter, look up all the monsters, I like to copy the stat blocks off to an encounter sheet so I don't have to go looking them up in uh, books later. Uh, but this is painstaking and time consuming and very repetitive. Uh, definitely you know, hurts my hand and takes hours and hours and you get tired of copying the same goblins or the same skeletons uh, over and over again. Uh, this is a lot of work even for a short adventure like the uh, Lost Mine of Fendelver, but it is uh, definitely does not scale to a big campaign in one of the hardbacks. Uh, especially if it's a sandbox type adventure where uh, you have a lot of issues with the plot being able to fan out along multiple paths and so you have so much more that you have to prepare at once because you're not sure which direction your players are going to go. We also uh, have a lot of tedium around keeping track of whose turn it is and how long various things are in effect. So, example, if we're running an encounter, everybody has to roll initiative to establish turn order. We maybe copy those names out onto a numbered list, and the play goes from highest to lowest, and that cycle repeats again at the top of the round until the uh, encounter is concluded. Uh, this can be a lot of extra rolling for the DM, and it is really easy and also very embarrassing to lose track of whose turn it is. I've, I've done this in live play, and it really makes me feel bad. Uh, and so that's just the start of it. There's a lot to track. It can be really tedious. We're at a point in 2019 where pencil and paper have become just too tiresome and inefficient. Now, eventually, he says, D&D Beyond will solve all of my problems, but it's taken them nearly two years to get to the point where they're just starting on encounter tracking. My need is immediate, and I don't need all that fancy web UI, although D&D Beyond is really cool, and I'm a big, big fan. So I'm looking forward to being put out of business by uh, the, the big boys here. Now, I've heard, he says, that you have some experience with the language of the snake cult. <laughs> I believe that if you were to visit their temple, you might bring back some magical knowledge that will ease my burdens. Will you do it? What say oh, you? Yeah. All right. Huzzah. So, <laughs> exposure. Uh, so the man offers a slender metal rectangle that bears the fruited mark of the gnomish artisans of Cupertino. <laughs> It opens, it opens like a clam shell to reveal a glowing screen and many tiny keys. As you take hold of the device, there's a flash of light, and you and Pip are transported into darkness. As you're starting to worry about whether you'll be eaten by a Gru, you suddenly hear voices. Welcome to our temple, says a voice. It is a special place where incantations of Python code become reality. We're terribly sorry about the lack of hospitality, and the light, says another voice. All of the snake cultists are currently attending Pi Waterdeep, so we weren't <laughs> expecting visitors. <laughs> we'll grant you the knowledge you seek, says the first, if you can show your skill in five challenges. In the darkness, you hear something that sounds like slithering. Pip lights a torch and reveals your surroundings. You're in a large room, slightly wider than it is deep, with a smooth obsidian floor and no visible exits. Evenly spaced columns run along both sides of the room. You'd guess maybe 80 columns total. In the center of the room, in the center of the room is a bag containing tools, parts, and a scroll labeled README. You begin to read and tinker. So I grew up on interactive fiction games like the Zork series and was really into MUDs in high school, so a terminal app feels like a great fit for my needs. I basically wanted a REPL like the Python interpreter, but for running D&D games. 
So uh, Prompt Toolkit is awesome for this. It is a library for creating interactive command line and terminal applications in Python. It supports a ton of features, like getting and validating input, styled output, colors, auto-suggestion, auto-completion, key bindings, multi-line input, and a whole lot more. So let's get started doing that. So we need to uh, import a uh, prompt method from Prompt Toolkit. Uh, and all we have to do is ask for some user input. We uh, ask it for uh, prompt. The, String that's in quotes there is what gets displayed in the terminal. And then let's echo it back. And let's wrap that in an endless loop so that we can keep uh, taking those commands until we're done playing. Now, there are lots of ways we can customize a prompt, but that means passing the same arguments over and over every time. And we might ask for input in more places in our application than just this main prompt. So instead, we can use a prompt session. We just replace the prompt method with an import of prompt session, spin up that uh, session object, and we can just call it its prompt method. That way, any time uh, we call that, it will behave consistently, and we won't have to pass any other arguments to it. <laughs> the obsidian floor begins to glow with words and symbols that appear on it, and it looks like this. So we can see it taking text and echoing back. Nice and simple. All right, since we have a prompt session, we can have it suggest things that we've entered previously as we start typing. So let's see what that does. So now you can see it doing sort of that grayed out uh, thing that came from our history. We can also wire up text suggestion and completion based on, say, a set of known words. So we can use a word completer, which is something that comes out of the box, give it some words that we're likely to type, and uh, spin up that word completer, and pass that into the prompt session. And when we look at what that does, we can see it start offering a menu of choices. And you can navigate that with the keyboard or it will start narrowing those down as you type. Okay, so a nice thing that we might wanna do is also add a bottom toolbar to our application so that we have some display that uh, is nice and consistent, makes it feel a little more polished than just typing in a blank terminal window. Uh, so we can make a function called bottom toolbar and we'll pass that to the prompt session as bottom toolbar equals our function. And then it starts displaying whatever text that we wanted to have. So now we have a nice clue as to how do we get out of this if uh, we want to exit. Uh, we can also take our bottom toolbar and instead of returning a string, we can change that to return a list of tuples. The first element in that tuple is going to be a class attribute that we can use to style this toolbar. And then we can add our text back in. Now to make it pretty, we will import the style class make a style object using its from dict method and pass it sort of a CSS-like string uh, that specifies the name of the class and the coloring that we're going to apply. And then we pass that into the prompt session and it looks like that. And now we have some nicely styled text. Uh, and we've also changed the background color of that bottom toolbar. So, as we complete these words, a section of the stone wall to the west slides open revealing a passage that curls away to the north. You and Pip go into the tunnel, then the floor suddenly drops away. You tumble through a winding tube that deposits you into a circular room about 40 feet across. Four evenly spaced levers are ensconced in the smooth stone walls. As you study the room, you hear a click sound from the floor, and a stone panel slides down behind you, blocking the way that you arrived. You hear the sound of stone against stone, mighty gears in motion. The ceiling begins to slowly, inexorably lower, crushing down on you. You and Pip start to pull at the levers, but they have no effect. If only we had two more of us, you say. I bet we have to pull all four levers at once. Pip reaches into their bag of warehousing and pulls out Tommel, Adders, and Click. These should help, they say. So TOML is Tom's obvious minimal language. It's a data serialization language designed for minimal config files with obvious uh, semantics. And it's a nice alternative to YAML and JSON. Uh, it lets us define things in data without having to hard code them in our application. And because it's plain text, we can keep it in Git, we can version it, and we can branch it, uh, which is gonna come in real handy later when we want to customize and tune our adventure to the party that we're working with. So let's see what it looks like. Here's some Tommel that represents what a dungeon master needs to know about a character. Uh, she has a name, she's got a race, she's got a, cl a character class, a level, some hit points, uh, a dictionary of senses. When we parse that, we get a Python dictionary that looks like this. So you can see here that the text between those brackets, uh, like the square brackets up there, uh, becomes a key uh, in that dictionary, 
and the name value pairs that are beneath it become the contents of that dictionary, uh, nesting it nicely in there. And you can make an additional nested dictionary by using the dot operator, so we hang that uh, senses dictionary off of the serial dictionary. So here's a more involved example. This is just sort of uh, some highlights of it. Uh, this represents a monster stat block. So this is a thing I would have to copy out by hand. Uh, now I only have to type it once. Um, so things like its strength, and dexterity, some notes about it, its skills, any features that it has, like its nimble escape uh, ability or the scimitar that it might attack with. Uh, you can also check out the cool triple quoted multi-line strings just like Python. So this is another reason I love uh, Toml. It looks just like Python. And so then here comes a big efficiency win for preparing. Once we have monsters, we can compose them by groups into encounters. So an encounter might have a, a name, a location, some notes, uh, and those groups of monsters that are gonna be present. No more copying this stuff out longhand on every single page. Super great. All right, so now it's easy to define that data and bring it into Python. It would be nice to have some proper model objects to put it into, and that's where Adders comes in. Adders is a great library that makes it really easy to create classes without a bunch of boilerplate that spares us from meaningless init methods that just take arguments and save them uh, as attributes on your object. Uh, adders is great when you want a data class, but a data class that does a little bit more stuff. Uh, and it has a more minimal syntax that you can use and a more verbose syntax. And apologies to Hinnick, uh, I prefer the latter because I apparently don't have a sense of humor. Uh, so we'll import adders and a trib from the adder library. Uh, we'll put the adders decorator onto our character class, define a bunch of attributes and give them some same defaults. Uh, we can have those be strings or integers or, or whatever. Uh, but if the default for one of those attributes is going to be a mutable thing like a dictionary, we're gonna need to use a factory function to make sure we get a fresh dictionary every time. Otherwise, every character is gonna get, end up sharing the same dictionary and we don't want that. Uh, we don't want people's attributes leaking back and forth uh, between different characters. So in this case, we use an adder factor, you know, excuse me, a factory object. I like to call that an adder factory so it looks just like those other attributes. And you pass a callable into it that it knows uh, how to stamp out uh, your default with. All right, so let's wire this all up. We'll import the Toml library, uh, open our file up for reading uh, with all of our party characters in it. Uh, we'll load them uh, like we saw earlier with uh, toml.load, so that'll parse it into a Python dictionary. And then using a dictionary comprehension, we can make a dictionary of character objects keyed by the character's name so that we can easily find them later. So it's a lot easier to look up, uh, you know, Serial or, or Lander or one of these other people. Uh, so we'll pass all the name value pairs from our Toml data into the character using the star star operator, and adders will take care of the rest. It's almost like magic. Uh, so then we might want to know where our party file is coming from or be able to use different ones at different times. So Click is a really helpful library for this. Click helps us to write beautiful command line interfaces. It makes it super easy to wire up well-behaved parameters and it makes really nice help output. It's also well covered in other talks. Go check one of those out. Uh, I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail today. Uh, but let's turn to our prompt loop and turn that into a function that our program is going to call when it starts up. Then we'll import click, and we'll apply the click.command decorator onto that main loop function so that click is gonna have an entry point into our program. We can add options to our program using the click.option decorator and include help text or defaults and all kinds of other fun stuff. And then magically, as you add that option, you start getting arguments passed into that function. So as we're taking a uh, party argument, we'll have a party parameter going into the main loop. Uh, so we might want to save off uh, that value into some settings so that we can remember that for later. And then if we've had one specified, it'll be a none if we don't. Uh, if we have one specified, we can go load up all of our characters. Uh, if you wanted to add more options, uh, you just add more click.option decorators. Uh, so in this case, where do we find our pool of monsters to draw from? Where do we find our pool of encounters to draw from? All right, but let's take our uh, more simpler uh, example that we were just looking at. And let's see what that looks like. So here we can see this is what our Toml file looked like. And as we start up our example, well, we can see uh, help text happening. And then we've loaded some characters. Um, cool, cool, cool. All right. So uh, 
As you speak these words of the Python spell, our friend Serial the Elf Ranger, Lander the Human Fighter, uh, and Pip who's already there, appear in the room with us. Uh, crawling quickly to avoid the crushing weight that's descending on you, the four of you pull the levers together and the ceiling rises once more. Three stone doors slide open, revealing exits to the north, the west, and the south. To the north and west, stairs lead down, and to the south, stairs lead up. Which way do we want to go? South. South? south. You, you hear the sound of a pun to the north. North. Nor okay, we'll go to the north. There's a pun. <laughs> You'll like it. So down the stairs, the passage curves sharply, connecting the west and north tunnels. Following that tunnel to the east, you find stairs that descend steeply into a tangled mess of thick cobwebs, some of which appear to have the remains of unfortunate adventurers still caught in them. Giant spiders, says Serial the Ranger. I'd stake my life on it. Oh, let's turn around, says Pip. We don't have time for web development. Oh! Lander and the rest of the audience groan disapprovingly. So to the south, stairs lead up. The passage turns to the west, and you go up some more stairs to enter a large, mostly square room with a gently curved wall to the west. Thick columns along the north and south walls rise up to an arched ceiling. In the middle of the room is a large stone pit filled with small wriggling snakes. A stone door to the east with a large keyhole appears to be locked. Serial observes that there's an elvish inscription on the door. She translates and says, command the serpents and they shall become your instruments. Okay, so let's make our application do something. Two of the really core things in Dungeons and Dragons are rolling dice and keeping track of whose turn it is. So let's start with dice, because rolling dice is fun. So these weird expressions tell us how to roll dice in Dungeons and Dragons. The first number tells us how many of a die to roll. So one or two, three or one here in this example. And the D whatever tells us what shape of die we're going to be rolling, how many sides it has. These are polyhedral dice. Some might have four sides or six sides or eight sides, et cetera. Uh, and we might have some plus or minus to adjust the result after we sum up everything that we've rolled. So uh, like in a case of a, like 3D4 plus 3, we're going to roll three four-sided dice and add three to it. All right, so let's make a command that can roll dice. Well, we need to start with random so that we can generate some random numbers. We'll make a function that takes those dice parameters we just looked at. Uh, start with a nice uh, place uh, to start, zero. Uh, we'll roll as many times as we're told to and get our random number and add it to the result. We'll roll between one and the number of sides that we have. And then return that plus the modifier. Or if you're really into code golf, you can make this a one-liner, but it might not be as clear. This was kind of fun to do, but uh, I, I don't know that I recommend it all the time. Um, but we really want to turn one of these expressions, a string, into a rolled number. So that means it's time for a regular expression. So this regular expression tries to parse a string into how many dice we're going to roll, how many sides the die will have, and whether we need to add or subtract anything from the total. We use those parentheses to isolate the groups that we're going to remember for later. Uh, we don't want the plus inside the last group because it won't turn into an int nicely, but we do want the minus if it's there. So that's why it's on the inside of the parents. Now, our new function will take a dice expression, string, and try to match it against that regular expression. Now, this would be a really great place for a walrus operator. I'm really looking forward to 3.8. Uh, I, I love it so much, yay, walrus operator. Um, and if we match, uh, then we can get those key parameters out of the groups that we captured. And we'll turn them into ints so that we can do math with them. And then all we need to do is call our other roll dice function to do the work and return the result. So now we need to update our prompt loop to do that dice rolling. We'll split the user input on spaces. The first item will choose the command we execute, and everything else will be arguments for that command. Uh, and if we don't get any user input, we'll just go back and prompt again. So now if our command is roll, uh, we will go and call that uh, roll dice expression. And it might be nice to roll as many as we want. So you could roll 1d20, 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 or, uh, and get multiple different rolls. 
in the current version of Dungeons and Dragons, we often do uh, two 1d20 rolls at a time to roll with what's called advantage or disadvantage. Uh, it's pretty cool, it's a neat mechanic. You either, if you've got advantage, you roll two and you take the better one. If you have disadvantage, you roll two and take the worse one. Uh, yeah, so we wanna make it easy to do that. Uh, so we'll use that list comprehension to iterate across all of the ones that we entered. Uh, and then we'll omit the results, just join them up nicely with uh, a comma there. And if we don't have a command that we know, let's complain about it so that we get some feedback to the user. All right, so let's see that in action. Oh, and I've gone past my video. Are you gonna play? There we go. So here we're rolling some things. We can see it still completering. And here we're taking a couple of different, uh, yeah, rolling with advantage and disadvantage to do some things, and we're rolling with modifiers. So yay, random numbers, rolling dice. Uh, so now we need to take turns uh, with initiative. So D&D, as we mentioned earlier, has this thing called initiative. We roll a d20 and we go from the highest to lowest to determine who goes when. Uh, so let's say we all roll for initiative. And if we write down the results, it might look something like this. So Serial rolled a 20. Uh, the two, uh, Goblin 1 and Goblin 3, those goblins rolled a 13. Uh, Lander, Goblin 4, and Pip rolled a 10, and so forth. Now to me, that looks an awful lot like a dictionary of lists. So let's use that as the core of our turn tracker. We'll use a default dict so that it's easier to add new combatants into the turn order. So anytime we reference some initiative value that's not already in that default dict, it'll go ahead and create a new list with that role as the key and an empty list that we can start putting things into. Uh, we we'll wanna keep track also of the round number so that we can understand the passage of time during combat. We need to be able to add someone to the turn order so let's add an add combatant method. Uh, and this function just appends them into the right spot in that default dictionary. We'll also need to remove combatants for various reasons. Maybe they run away, maybe they're defeated, maybe uh, they disappear for some reason. Uh, so we'll walk through the different combatants in the initiative uh, dictionary. Uh, and one catch here uh, as we try to remove them is that that list remove method will throw an exception if the item we're trying to remove isn't actually in the list. So we need to check first to see if they're there before we try to do it. Uh, now, let's make a generator to give us the next turn. We're gonna loop through all the combatants and then repeat and repeat and repeat until we're done with our combat. So each trip through the loop is gonna represent a round of combat. So while we've got some initiative going on, we'll increment the round number uh, we'll get the combatant lists ordered highest initiative to lowest, so that's why we've got the reversed sorted. Uh, we'll loop across all of those uh, combatant groups that we get, and uh, to get, we get each combatant in turn and walk over them. And we'll yield some info about where we are, like the round number and whether you know, we're in 20 or 13 or, or 10 or whatever, and whose turn it is now. And uh, to advance this one turn at a time, rather than consuming it in an entire list, because we would just consume this endlessly, uh, we want to explicitly call next on our generator. So first, we call generate turns to return that generator object to get the actual generator we can use. And then we can start looping over. So let's say we generated some output uh, with a for loop here, uh, and we'll do next on turns. So each time we want to advance a turn, we call next with that turn generator. And it does something like this. We emit round one, initiative 20, serial. Round one, initiative 13, goblin one. Round one, initiative 13, goblin three, and so forth. And then it becomes the second round or the 42nd round as time passes. So this is pretty great, but there is an embarrassing bug here. Do you see it? So if we look at that initiative dictionary, let's say uh, we're in initiative 10, and it's uh, either Lander or Goblin's four, Goblin 4's turn, but Goblin 4 is removed for some reason. Maybe they're defeated. And this happens before it gets, the turn order gets to Pip. Because we modified the list that we're iterating over, Pip actually gets skipped, and now it's Goblin 2's turn. And I actually had this happen to me with this code in a live session, and I was super embarrassed because Pip was the person I had skipped accidentally in a paper and pencil session. So I had done the same thing with the same person, written code to solve it, and still it blew up in my face. So I was really glad to fix this. Um, so uh, we can fix this by making a copy of that combatants group before we loop across it. And then we skip any combatant who's in that copy, but is no longer in the real list. 
Now, when Goblin 4 is removed, play proceeds as expected, and I don't forget pip anymore. So a nice thing we might do is wrap all this up in a class so that our state is better encapsulated and we have this nice turn manager object to work with. So now we need to wire up that next command. Uh, we will uh, just prompt it for uh, you know, getting the next turn, the round number, the initiative, and the combatant, and we'll print out the result, and it looks kind of like this. So you can see we've added some folks in the initiative, and we're looping through, and hooray, it advances the turn. So Serial uses her animal handling skill as a ranger, and uh, she rolled an 18, she did really good. Uh, she reaches into the pit of snakes and draws one out. As she commands it uh, to be a set of dice, the snake becomes a set of dice in her hands. Serial scoops out more snakes, and as you invent various commands together, they become rods, rings, and other devices. Finally, you produce a key. It fits the keyhole, and the door unlocks. Gathering your new possessions, you head east down a long passage and emerge into a similarly shaped room, curved this time on the eastern wall. Long shelves along the north and south walls hold a series of identical boxes with hinged lids. A closed stone door on the west wall won't budge, uh, and there's no keyhole this time. On the east side of the room, several steps lead up to a wide dais. On the wall behind the dais is a design carved into the stone. It looks like this. A rectangle connected by arrows to a tree of other rectangles, each bounding a niche that's cut into the wall. Lander studies them for a while and observes they're about the same size as those boxes over on the shelves. He makes a history check, and let's say for the sake of the plot that he rolled a natural 20. <laughs> Aha, he exclaims, this looks like a class diagram. It would be a lot easier, you think, for all of those commands we just made to be a little more uniform and more easily dispatched. So up until now, we've just been cramming commands into this long and ever-growing chain of ifs and elifs, but that's gonna get messy very quickly and be very hard to extend. So let's package things up so that they're tidier and easier to add new ones. While we're here, it's a good time to think about moving some code around so it all isn't in that giant pile. We might pull out the dice rolling into its, and the turn tracking code, but what really matters for this next section is that we wanna put each of our commands into a separate file within a commands directory that has an under under init pi so that we can import things out of it. So let's make a command class and put it in that init pi. Uh, it's going to have one or more keywords that can be used to invoke it. And we'll keep a reference to uh, say a global game state object that'll be useful later and we'll hand wave away for right now because of time. Uh, and we'll tell the game's dictionary of commands that it has that each of our keywords points to this particular command instance that we have, this object. And we'll let it, the, you know, the user know that we've registered this is a command that we can do by inspecting the, the class name of what we've just registered. So great, now it's registered as something we can do. Uh, we'll need a thing for it to do. So let's make a do command function and it'll take uh, some arguments. Uh, and our base class shouldn't do much. Uh, and it might be nice also to add a hook for showing some interactive help text so you can remember how things work while you're playing the game. Uh, I use this a lot. Uh, it'll just print out the help text, uh, strip out any space around the end. Um, but maybe we wanna make this possible for a command to uh, not blow up the game if it doesn't have any help text on it, so uh, we'll check that with a, a get adder first and maybe print out a message that that command doesn't have any help text uh, available if we don't find any. All right, so now let's wrap up our dice rolling command. Uh, we'll make a command subclass. Uh, we'll give it some keywords so we can use either roll or dice to invoke the dice rolling. We'll give it some help text eventually. Uh, and then we'll do the command. So we'll just take our existing dice rolling code out of that big pile that we had and put it in here. So we'll do that same list comprehension to roll all the dice a bunch of times and print out the results. And the next turn command is very similar. It does, uh, uh, the same sort of thing, advancing the uh, turn using that next to call, uh, the, you know, to, to advance the generator that we had set up. So great, now we have a lot of classes. Uh, we could manually import all of those commands and register them when our program starts up, and I did that for a while, uh, but it gets really tiresome, and it's easy to forget. If you're building out a new command, you've just spent like an hour writing a thing, um, it's easy to forget to register it, and then you start it up to demo it, and there's no command, and why is there no command? 
So would it be nice if we could find and register all of our commands dynamically? So we'll need some more friends from the standard library for this, particularly import lib and package util. Uh, so we'll make a nice little function called load commands to load up our commands at the start of the, the game session. Uh, we'll use path to uh, figure out where our classes live relative to the program that we're running. Uh, we'll use packageutil.ittermodules to find all the Python modules in that directory and look at what we found. If we've already loaded a module up uh, with a particular name, we'll skip over it so we don't clobber it. Uh, otherwise, we'll go ahead and import that module using import lib. Uh, then we want to use, uh, in this case, the, use the module name to determine the class name in that module that we're going to instantiate. I chose to make a snake-cased module name into a camel-cased class name here. So we're splitting on the underscores and title-casing each part and then just gluing it all together. Uh, and once we know the class's name, we can try to acquire it with getAdder and skip it if we don't uh, find the class that we expect. And finally, instantiate that instance and let it go uh, register itself. So now we can clean up all that ungainly dispatching by throwing almost all of this away. So we want to make sure our commands are loaded. Oops. And then we'll get the command name from the user input and use that to look up the command class that we want, uh, or the command object that we want to use. Uh, if we find one, we go ahead and run it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we just complain to the user that we don't know that command. So all of that if, elif, elif, elif garbage gone, and we just have this nice, tidy package. So let's see how that works. Uh, so we can see it uh, registered our next turn in our roll dice commands, uh, and everything still works. Sweet. So as we finish this incantation, uh, as we finish this incantation, the boxes on the wall begin to glow. You and your party place the snake command items one by one into the, uh, into the holes in the wall. Uh, and, excuse me, you place the snake command items one by one into the boxes and place the boxes into the niches on the diagram. The diagram itself begins to glow and the stone door slides open. You follow the passageway down two flights of stairs and then it turns sharply south, opening at last into what looks like the same obsidian floored room that you arrived in. Pip looks stricken. Will our journey never be complete, they wail. Complete, that gives you an idea. You reach for prompt toolkit again. So we talked about completion earlier, and let's uh, do it better now. Uh, so we can manually create a set of words to feed into our word completer, but it might be better to automatically discover them from our registered commands. So uh, we can pull that out of the keys in our commands dictionary. But eventually we want more sophisticated commands with more sophisticated arguments. And the completion suggestions that we show should be appropriate to the context, both of the particular command we're running and the position of the arguments within the overall uh, structure of arguments being typed in. So we'll make a command completer. And we'll need some things uh, that we need to import to work with. So we'll import completer and completion. Our command completer will subclass completer. Uh, we'll set up an init to preserve the parameters that our completer will need. There's more that it can do in a typical completer, but this is sort of the minimal for us. We'll remember all the command objects, as well as a sorted list of all of their keywords. Now, the most important part of being a completer is providing a get completions method. This needs to be a generator that yields completion objects. This can get a little gnarly, so we gotta buckle up and we might have to make some intelligence saves along the way. So this method is basically gonna do a few things. It's gonna figure out what's been typed so far, find out what completions we might suggest, figure out if a completion is valid, and yield out each valid completion. Okay, so this is gonna go pretty fast. We need to remember what's been typed so far, so we'll call that the word that's before the cursor, and that's a thing that we get from the document object that Prompt Toolkit gives us. It's what, what's been typed so far right now. Uh, we might wanna ignore the case, and uh, in case that, and, or in that case, we uh, lowercase the word before the cursor. Now, we wanna find out what completions we might wanna suggest. So we'll start with an empty list of suggestions. Uh, we'll split the document text list that we had on spaces there. And this will help us understand if we have a single word that we're at or if we've had multiple words chained together. So if we're at the first position, we've only had uh, zero or one thing typed so far, uh, we're gonna look at the base commands, that list of all those command keywords as our initial suggestions and offer those up. Otherwise, if we already have that first word there and we know that it's one of our registered commands, that's something we know about, then we can reach into it 
and grab that command object from uh, all the commands that we remembered and ask the command to supply its own suggestions based on what's been typed and how far along we are. So now, let's see, did I have anything I want to say about that? No. Okay, cool. So now we make a quick function to see if the typed text matches up with a suggestion option, or more to the point, to see if a suggestion option matches up with the typed text. So we'll use this to know what suggestions to show the user and change them as they type. So we can customize how the matching works, uh, either ignoring the case or matching from the middle of the string rather than the beginning of the string. So we'll pass that suggestion in and see if it matches the word that uh, we're looking at uh, that's you know, been typed so far. Otherwise, we'll return uh, you know, with the you know, start position, you know, matching it from the start of the word. Um, okay, so then next, we want to look at all the suggestions that we have and yield all the valid ones uh, and see if they match what's been typed. So we check that word matches function. If the suggestion checks out, we yield a completion object that knows what suggestion to show and where to position it into the input buffer. Now, we need to make this negative because we want to step back a few characters and overwrite the word that's been typed. Otherwise, what we're gonna end up with is uh, a mangled input that concatenates what has been typed with what was suggested. So if the command was dice, and you typed di and then completed dice, you'd have di dice. And then we would say, well, we don't know a command called di dice, and you'd be upset. So we don't want that. Upset is exactly the opposite of what we want. All right, so all done. Did everybody pass your intelligence saves? Sort of, okay, yeah, this was a little weird the first couple times that I messed with this too. Uh, there's a lot more uh, things that you can do with it that I'm not gonna go into here. Great, so now we need to make our commands class know uh, that it can offer suggestions. Uh, so we'll start with the base class, uh, giving it um, basic get suggestions that returns an empty list. Uh, but say we have a command like damage combatant that can do damage to one or more people uh, in the game or creatures in the game. Uh, it should suggest combatants, so it's, it'll have a get suggestions method. And we'd like to look at everybody that's already been specified. So if you've typed three characters' names, those characters we might not want to show as suggestions because you've already said you're going to damage that person or that, that creature. Uh, so we'll subtract everyone who's already been chosen from the set of all the people that we might uh, interact with, giving us a sorted list of combatants that haven't been chosen yet. And this uh, looks kind of like this. Uh, so we can see as we go that as we type, we're removing some of those suggestions. And we'll have one here where we're, I think we're going to do three people. And, yep, so on Lander's turn, maybe a, a trap happens. And you can see each time there are fewer suggestions uh, as, as we go. All right. So as this spell is completed, Sections of the obsidian floor suddenly slide upward with a grinding sound and a tremendous noise, forming a spiral staircase that leads up and out of the room through an opening you hadn't previously seen. Ascending the stairs, you emerge into a vast chamber of dark stone. Yeah, somebody got it. Good, thank you. Uh, ringed with stairs that lead up and out of the temple. Two giant blue and gold serpents appear from the shadows and begin to speak. You recognize the voices that you heard earlier in the darkness. Well done, you've learned much, says the first, and earned your reward. In your hands, you suddenly find scrolls filled with code, examples, and documentation. <laughs> Will we see you again, says the other, perhaps at Pine Neverwinter. The CFP is open. <laughs> The serpents laugh, there's another bright flash, and you and your companions are back at the tavern. Your client seems excited and starts listing off all the ideas he has for new features and commands. But for you, for now, it's time to celebrate the conclusion of another adventure. All right, thank you. So, this has been just a tiny look at what's, uh, this has been just a tiny look at what's been possible and only a fraction of what I've implemented so far. What we've seen today are sort of the fundamental building blocks that everything else follows from. 
Uh, I don't have a ton of time today, and I want to make sure that you get to lunch soon, uh, get in on, on the yummy sandwiches or whatever we have on offer. Uh, but I would be delighted to sit down for some one-on-ones, do some demos. You can see all kinds of things like splitting the party or rejoining the party or stashing and unstashing, loading encounters, uh, navigating actual uh, you know, combat situations, and see what gameplay is like with this tool. Um, but uh, if you don't want to do that today, that's also cool, but you can check out these links. Uh, I will be posting the slides soon, so don't fret. Uh, I'll be on, on the Twitters with that. So uh, my blog is at mike.peernot.com. You can follow me at mpeernot on Twitter to learn more. Uh, if you want to check out uh, that GitHub repo, dndme, that is the actual tool that I've been working on off and on for a couple of years. Uh, like I said, I'd be glad to chat here and on Twitter too. I also want to thank the authors of these great tools. Uh, they've been really, really helpful, and I've gotten a ton of mileage out of them, so thanks to all of uh, the folks responsible for them. Also, quick thanks for all of the resources that I uh, borrowed to put this together uh, to add a little bit of graphical flair. Uh, I did really enjoy hand drawing the dungeon on uh, pencil and graph paper and getting that scanned in. That was, uh, you know, really took me back. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I also want to thank Zapier. Uh, for making it possible for me to be here today. Uh, we are also seeking brave adventurers to join us in our quest to democratize automation. Uh, we have positions open for engineering wizards, support paladins, data sorcerers, and more. Uh, you can check out our current offerings at zapier.com jobs, or come talk to me about what it's like to work for an all-remote company that does neat things with Python and is just full of some of the most wonderful people. Uh, and finally, thanks to all of you for coming to this talk. I hope you had fun. I hope you learned, some <clears throat> hope you learned something. And I hope <clears throat> that you have an excellent, excellent day. Take care. Thank you.